Welcome to the Future of Democracy, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. Uh, this is a show that is re it's really like the op-ed page of our democracy. It's where we take a look at some of the most challenging issues uh, in our country today and try to unpack them with different scholars, thinkers, and practitioners. And uh, this episode is part of a great series we've got going with the Miami Book Fair, the 37th Annual Miami Book Fair, which is running virtually from November 15th to 22nd. Um, we will be sitting down uh, over the whole month of November uh, in the lead up to that, talking to many of the incredible artists uh, and authors who are participating in the book fair. Uh, but I would encourage everyone to check out the whole of the book fair. All readings, presentations, and conversations at the 2020 Miami Book Fair will be free, but only available from November 15th to 22nd. You just need to visit miamibookfaironline.com or follow them on Twitter at Miami Book Fair. And you can hear from folks like Margaret Atwood, Bill Nye the Science Guy, Natalie Portman, just incredible, incredible authors. One of those authors is Nikki Finney. She is a National Book Award-winning poet, uh, and she recently released an incredible collection of poems called Love's, Love Child's Hotbed of Occasional Poetry, Poems and Artifacts. I had the chance to sit down with Nikki, talk about the work, talk about her life, and talk about her views on our country today. I hope you enjoy. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for asking me to be here, it's a pleasure. So the first thing that struck me uh, in looking at the work is it's a, it's a book of occasional poetry. Tell us a bit about what that means. Traditionally, the occasional poem was written for a wedding, a ceremony, something official um, in the region, in the town um, from hundreds of years ago. It became an, the occasion as something that was kind of separated from real life, separated from the ongoing daily quotidian kinds of things. So we're going to do an occasional poem and let there be horns and um, flashing lights in whatever era we were in and let it be an occasion. But the way I interpret occasional poetry is the way I first came to being, and you were asked, the poet was asked to prepare a poem for this moment, this special moment. But I was asked as a girl to prepare poems for special moments that happened in the quotidian. Mrs. Robinson's 90th birthday, the 50th anniversary of the church I attended, things that nobody outside of that community might be, might care about. And so they didn't, of course, call it the occasional poem. They called it, Nikki's 10 years old. She's got, always got a pencil on her ear and a box of paper in her back pocket. She thinks she's a poet. Let's give her a whirl. And so they would ask me, and I interpreted this in my own way as, them asking Mr. Brown to put a new roof on their house or Mr. Green to rewire the electricity. There was something that was necessary about that work. And because I loved poetry so much and, and was so attached to words, I saw something necessary in their ask of me. Crazy as it may seem, I worked very hard on those terrible poems and also became, um, became close to the, the sort of exchange that sometimes happens between somebody who wants a poem, needs a poem, and comes to a poet with that question on the tip of their tongue. So that's what this book, after I won the National Book Award in 2011, it seemed to me that people were coming to me in that way that they had come to me when I was a girl saying, we have this project, we have this idea, what do you think? And for most poets, that's not something that you really want to get involved with because it's not something that you feel inspired by. But every time I said yes, I had something there in the mix that I felt inspired by. And so I ended up with a sheaf of occasional poems uh, at this point in my life. And I thought this would be really interesting to put into a text and see what else they could generate. I do, you know, one, one sort of thing 
I struggle with listening to you is um, more profoundly is I think it feels to so many Americans, to so many people around the world, maybe even even before COVID, that sort of something you said, like the quotidian is an occasion now, like there's an occasion around a moment of justice. There's an occasion around a moment of injustice. There's an occasion, um, it, certainly this year in surviving, you know, like taking care of your kids or taking care of a loved one is the quotidian and the occasional. I think a lot of Americans feel that politics has become something that demands an occasional effort in the sense that you're describing. How do you, what, what demands have you felt as an artist in the country today? Well, I think one of the things that I'm really struck by has to do with, I have never felt outside of anything that was going on in my country. I have, even though that country calls upon artists, it seems on special occasions, yeah. I am all, I'm right, you know, like the inauguration of somebody or, you know, oh, let's bring the poet in. Other cultures that I, that I love and study and, and, and try to keep myself familiar with always have the artist first. It's almost as if the artist comes in to clear the air, to make a way for what's going, the laws and everything else that come next. And I am more attuned to that than anything because I write every day. Um, I don't compose a poem every day, but I'm always thinking about language, which is the thing us, you know, we humans share with each other. And so I've been sequestered a bit in my house, in my room, but I'm always kind of sequestered in here. I'm not trying to um, take any of the uh, horrific um, news of the day away from this moment, but I'm saying the way, the way I get to my words and the way I get to language in the deepest way is in solitude and, and with quiet. And so I'm always searching for once I come out of the world for this. And so I've been writing a lot and I've been thinking a lot about what I see and hear and what I feel in my own life and my own family and my own community. And so as most of the artists ahead of me have taught me, now is the time to really bear down and listen with your ear as close to the ground as is possible because there's so much happening. There are so many pandemics. There are so many seas of different kind of waves of things. You don't have to wait long for another wave of something to wash over you. So I know this is a, I know this is a, a, a time like I've never lived in. And so I've been, I've been extra aware of that as I, as I scribble. I mean, I, I start, sort of thinking about the way you talk about the, you know, we go, we go to the, you know, we go to the artist when we think we're kind of done or we're beginning. And I, and I feel, and instead of in the middle, and I, it feels to me so like we're in this moment where the, the demand for sense making is so intense, right? It's the sense making of a young generation grappling with the generational threat around climate. It's the sense making of a black teenager grappling not only with injustice, but the proximate fear that this could happen to them. It's the sense making of their white friend trying to figure out, am I supposed to feel guilty or obligated or what, what is my response? It's the, it's the sense making of this disease, you know? And if you, like I have little kids who are, you're trying to explain to them what a pandemic with no end is. And it's like, we've delegated all our sense making to political performance. Like that's who we've decided to give whatever the ancient object is to the artist, we've given, instead of giving it to Homer, we've given it to an elected official to make sense for us. And in reading your book and in listening to you now, I, I, I was sort of been thinking about what, are, what kinds of sense-making are we leaving by the wayside by not turning to the artist, to the, and to the artist on occasion, you know, in the way that you mean it. Right, and, but Sam, you also have to think about where you get your news. Yeah. Where do you get information? You know, because I can't cut the TV on right now. I mean, I'm, I can't. I just have to. It's off. And that's for reason. That's a conscious attempt to keep that stream of consciousness out of this head and this heart. 
And so I've got to work really hard at what I put into this head and heart, which is what I say to my students, which is what I say when I do these podcasts and, and, and these things. It's like, you are partly responsible for what you take in. Not enough people and, listen to this. We're not contributing to the problem. So don't well, you know, I mean, you, because part of it is language. Yeah. Part of the problem is we're in a status, you know, status um, um, feeling about uh, what we take in as the, the language of the day. And if you don't work really hard at keeping that out, it becomes what guides you, what guides your principle, what guides you going to the grocery store, what guides your empathy, if you have any, or another human being who doesn't have what you have. And so the artist is always working. It's not just now in times of drought and famine and all these other kinds of you know extremes we're always working we're always putting things out into the world and we're always asking for a minute of your time we don't get cnn on that so we have other ways to do it we have other ways to subvert um the and and create the highway that we need to be the poets and the artists and the truth tellers that we are i mean baldwin said you know, James Baldwin said it a long, long time ago, and I know a lot of people are saying his name, but is the poet is the only people, right, who know the truth about us. Yeah. He said that in the 50s. I, I live by that. Not in some glorious, you know, way, but I, I live by it in terms of when I wake up, what do I have to pay attention to today? How do I put it out into the world? Those kinds of things, I'm, I'm just one. There are thousands of us. And we have to, and, and, and we, are, we, are, we are connected to other sources like you, foundations, people, uh, podcasts, who help us get the word out about what we're doing to circumvent that there's only one stream of reality right now. That is not so. It's not so. So one, uh, one thing that um, the, the, so much of the book to me is about is about you and about a period in your life about a relationship with your father and hovering in the penumbra of sort of all of that is of course just the, a fiery crucible of a past era of intense struggle how tell us about tell us about that tell us about your memory of that you're living through that but also tell us a bit about what, what we're talking about here like how is that art a part of that the truth telling about that era and, and perhaps about this era as well. Well, one, that era and this era are intimately connected and still going on. Um, nothing stopped. It, you know, there are things that went up and down and, you know, had a different head, but nothing has really changed. And that era that I'm speaking of most intensely and most intimately also harkens back to an era before that when I was not alive, when my parents were not alive, and hundreds of years before that. I'm deeply and intimately interested in the connections, in the things that we are trying to get right, because this is a democracy in progress still, no matter what, and the Constitution begins with that, you know, in order to be a more perfect, you know, we're not there yet, we're gonna put these things in place. And so I see what we've been doing in my life, my father's life, my grandfather and my grandparents' lives before that as, a, as, as stitching this road together a little bit stronger than it was before we got here. My father um, wanted to be a lawyer more than anything. He thought that he could serve his community, his people, his family, uh, as knowing the constitution, being a constitutional lawyer, uh, understanding the law of the land. And he was recruited at the age of like 26 in, he was in a small town, Conway, South Carolina, where I was born. He was recruited to Sumter, South Carolina, which was um, a part of, of the uh, map and landscape that SNCC and the civil rights movement had mapped out in order to how to get from the North to the South, to those places where young people had to get to. My father was recruited as a lawyer, just like he, if he was a basketball, he could have been the LeBron James <laughs> of his day, sorry. I don't wanna bring in anybody's name that, you know, but he could have been because they needed somebody who knew the constitution, who knew law, 
who was not afraid, who was just beginning his career, and they situated him in this land where he got six to 800 young people out of jail who were just determined that they, want, they would get a hamburger, they would get a milkshake, and they would have to you know, fight against injustice in, in this particular South land in order to change the laws of the, la the larger land. And my father was the really quiet lawyer who went to, to the jails and got people out and I would hang out with him. I'd say, where are you going? And he would say, well, we gotta go to jail today, baby. Uh, somebody went and got a hamburger and I was like, a hamburger? And he would have to explain to me about justice and how the law you know, is a slow working machine. And I would listen to this. And as I got older, and he saw my um, acuity for language, and he thought I should go to law school. And I was like, no, I don't want anything to do with it. I have two brothers who are lawyers. But his sense of justice, his sense of understanding that right is right and wrong is wrong hit me hard. And so in my work, that's what I, I feel like the shadow, his shadow is there. Um, through my understanding of what I see in my society, what I see in the world that is still out of whack and still not working in the way that he thought it should or my grandparents thought it should or that the Constitution says that it should. So I'm, I'm, I'm working as a poet in, in, on my lane and I'm trying to meet all the other people on their lane in, in bringing us closer to what our dream is for this country and what our dream is for each other, whether we're my generation or the generation I teach, you know, 19 year olds who don't know the Constitution, unfortunately, who don't have a, a background of civics in them because we've cut that out of the curriculum. We've cut out handwriting. They don't even know what their handwriting looks like. They know how to do this, but they don't have a sort of um, um, skin in the game about their individual life in this, in this sea of millions of, of others. And so as I was taught the whole of me, my teachers taught the whole of me, I'm trying to teach them a specific subject, but I'm also trying to get them in, involved in realizing their one life, their one voice, their one vote, all of that matters because that's how I was taught. And I'm going to believe that until they take me out of here. There's, um... So, so, so a lot of the, the work is sort of through in the through the, is the telling of you as a child in some cases a young child and that child is says things about joy and love and anxiety um, and contentment. What are the what are some of the things that that child is telling us about justice? Well, I remember one of the things that's in the book is a lime green letter handwritten by me at the age of 10. My mom leaves home for the summer. My dad's taking care of us and I'm writing to her because I miss her. And when you look at the date, it's July 5th, 1968. And what, if you know your history, I'm hoping, I don't, there's no footnote about that. You know, it's just a few months after Dr. King was murdered. Yeah. And one of the things that I remember about my life in the South, and those, you know, my, my formative years is that the backdrop was the Vietnam War, the Black Arts Movement, Dr. King, Malcolm X, the assassination of Dr. King, the assassination, murder, uh, John Kennedy, all of this, the, this, the war. Um, and so I saw my family in the heart of, of this, but I also remember my mom not allowing the TV to be on, kind of like what I'm doing right now, and immediately taking us over to a book or an art project to sort of quell the, mm -hmm. she, she couldn't stop it, but she taught me that the way to be a, a witness, and because she did tell us what was going on and we did talk about it eventually, was to be in it, but to also take care of yourself. Yeah. And so one of the things that I have always attempted to do is, do this and also tell my students, we have to fight, we have to be on the front line, we have to be in the streets doing what, you know, saying what we need to say. And we also have to pull back and take care of ourselves. And some of that I saw happening in this book. Some of the thing, the ephemera that I chose, I didn't want, you know, you can't be in battle all the time. It's impossible. 
And there are other kinds of really important relationships going on because as Toni Morrison taught us, you know, like she is only going to write from the perspective of what's happening in the black community, right? She's, you're not gonna force her into this position of embattlement because in that way she's racialized. Well, I also wanna talk about the love. This is a book about the love that was around me, the love that got us through slavery, the love that got us through segregation and, and sharecropping and all of those embattlements. But we never see, we don't see black people enough as love machines. <laughs> we, yeah. And we are, we, we just, we had to be, or we would have left here en masse a long time ago. So this book is filled with things that loved me up into this moment and also taught me how to fight. And I don't see any distraction, distortion, problem with those two things being in between these two covers. Yeah, the, 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 the ephemera you, you include is, re is remarkable. Um, if people, there's no cheating on this book. You've got to buy the book because the ephemera is a really critical part of the, it's a really critical part of the experience. So just for all the Thank listeners you. out there. You you got, you have to buy it. Um, but uh, tell, tell us a bit more about that choice as an artist. Well, I was telling somebody about a week ago and it was in the middle of the conversation. I said, you know, actually my, my dad would buy every book. There was a guy in, in the neighborhood, well, and the guy in the, in, the, in the state who was the bookseller. We didn't have bookstores in the town where I grew up. And so he would come through once a month and sell my father. And my father would buy whatever was in his car. He would open his trunk. He'd say, oh, I'll take that Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh, I'll take that Webster's. Oh, what's that over there? Gray's Anatomy. Okay, I'll take that. That was my dad. Because he, he knew that we would, that was the only way we were going to learn outside of this segregated society we lived in, right? And so I was talking about Love Child, and I was saying, you know what? I actually have enough ephemera and enough material where I could do an Encyclopedia Britannica of my life. I could do 20 volumes of letters, photographs, um, things from when I first started writing, uh, the Kroger poster, uh, which is my first announcement of my first book in the small town that I grew up in. You know, I just kept everything because my community, there was a lady in my community who would say, well, if you don't keep it, who's going to keep it? Who's going to value your life over your, anybody else's? You've got to, you're responsible for, for keeping up with who you are. And so I just started saving everything. And so when I got to this one volume, I, real, I didn't think I had an Encyclopedia Britannica. I didn't think Northwestern would do 20 volumes. So what I wanted to do was reach back for my ancestors, which I do at the beginning. I also um, reached out. I also had a quote, a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote that I had over my desk. And I was thinking in the same moment, would, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if Emerson could, could face Sandra Bland mm. uh, in perpetuity? Mm. And I found out that those quotes were exactly 140 years apart. Wow. And I thought that meant something to me. So it was that kind, those kind of decisions that made me put that there and that there. I was on an airplane back in, in the old country, I call it, when we flew on airplanes. And there was this guy who was talking about whales. And he said, you know, you could, you could hear whales. Whales could hear each other from one side of the ocean to the other before it got so noisy and I was like, <laughs> and you know, th those kind of moments where you're just in the world, you don't plan this, but I do believe that if you are in, if you are in search of wholeness and truth and re good relationships with the people, with people and, and uh, of all walks of life, you can listen and hear things that are totally unexpected and totally generative. You know, they just, they will make something else happen. You just have to be aware that what he just said is precious. And that's what I did. I wrote it down and then I wrote him two years later and I was like, can I use this? And he was like, sure, it's yours. So that's not me being special. That just, that's just me paying attention. And that's what artists do. We pay attention. I thought, you know, it's interesting. There's, and if I recall correctly, there's kind of a part of the preface where you sort of carve out this book is is not in a sense a political project but i 
I felt in some ways like in this moment, it was the most intensely political project because we're in a moment where the kind of the idea of mutual recognition is just so profoundly breaking down. Like people feel, don't feel, talk about Sandra Bland, talk about someone, when you watch that video, you're watching someone just not being recognized as a human. It is so, right. she's so stressed and she does so many things. She tries to smoke at some point. Like she does so many things to just like assert her humanity in right. the moment. And, and even, and this isn't to excuse them, but it's like even the sort of the, the sort of vitriol that's animating the other side is this sort of vitriol of like, I think I'm losing. I think I'm not being seen. I think no one is, hearing me and seeing me. And I, I, I was reading the book and I thought, you know, what would my ephemera be? Like, what would it mean to recognize me? I hope it's not a ballot in two envelopes. You know what I mean? Like, I hope it's what you left. I hope it's an image, a letter. Uh, there's some amazing, there's a letter after um, a, a valediction. There's a letter, there's a letter, a note from your father that's handwritten. And like, is, is the political project I think we're all missing is to be seen. Uh, as ourselves, to be invited to be seen, you but know. Sam, I mean, I don't know what you were reading to see that this wasn't a political project because, you know, I'm always aligning myself with the political. You know, like, is the air I'm, bre I'm breathing clean? Is the water I'm drinking, you know, without chemical? Those are political things to me. You know, everything seems, you know, has a, a notion. So if there's politics in this book, you know, yay, I'm, I'm all for that. But first and foremost, I'm an artist. First and foremost, I'm a poet. First and foremost, I want to tell some truth that we all need, not just about my life, but in the specificity of that, let there be the wings of the world, you know, but then let there be some beauty and let there be some, you know, some, something that somebody can go, oh, wait. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've heard from who've said, I don't have the letters from my father, but I have the memory of my father writing something, because I talk about my father's beautiful handwriting. I have all his, you know, hundreds of letters, but they don't, they got away from them. And I said, yeah, but you remembered that. You remembered he wrote you. You remember that he said um, that little funny thing that you just told me. I said, that's it. That's what I want to do. Not to make you sad that you threw it away or lost it, or it, it, when you moved the box was, but that we as a, as a world, like you and he, had a relationship that cannot be taken from you, that you should remember and hold up in some kind of way. That's what I wanted this book to do, to be a little, just a little nudge in that. To make you as a father, think about being with your kids and, oh, they're not gonna remember that. Oh, they will, and it will matter to them, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe down the line. We have to have that sort of long memory for each other. So let's, um, so I'd be like, I could talk to you all day, but you don't have all day. So I, so let me, let me, I have one, one kind of, one kind of question, sort of a gimmicky question, kind of where we started. So normally we call, the occasion we call on the artist for is something like an inauguration where it's pure performance. Let's imagine a different occasion. Let's imagine the occasion is the next president, whoever it is, is in a moment of open-mindedness. It's the occasion of, I want my mind to be changed. I want to learn something. On that occasion, in that moment, is there a poem in this book that you would want that next president to read and why? Oof. I want him to read the whole book. I don't <laughs> want him to just read one poem because there's not one poem in here. It's the, enti it's the entirety of what's at the beginning. You've got to know how far back I reach for that poem about um, black people who were enslaved, who were separated from each other. And, you know, that is deep inside of me. So you can't just read one of these poems. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't fall for the gimmick easily because I've worked so hard to put this together in this way. I would, you know, present it to anybody who would sit with it. It's a slow book. It's a quiet book. Yeah. It's not gonna, it requires you to leave everything kind of where it was and just hand yourself over to it. So no, it's, that would be like choosing children, you know, like a favorite. And I don't have that. It really works in tandem. Sorry. No, everyone should read the whole book. The, uh, the author is Nikki Finney. Uh, the work is Love Child's Hotbed of Occasional Poetry, Poems and Artifacts. Uh, you can learn more at NikkiFinney.net. Thank you so much for joining us. Sam, thank you. Stay well. 
All right, folks, every single one of these conversations is going to be released leading up to the 37th annual Miami Book Fair. It runs from November 15 to 22nd. Every conversation is free during that period. Check out MiamiBookFair.com or go to Twitter at Miami Book Fair. And remember, the future of democracy runs every Thursday live at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can learn more at kf.org slash FD show. Uh, you can also follow the FD podcast at Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, or wherever you follow podcasts. That's also where we will be releasing every single one of these exclusive conversations in partnership with the Miami Book Fair. And of course, feel free to send a question at any time to me on Twitter at the Sam Gill. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.